All right. Hi, everybody. Hi. 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 Thank you so much for coming out tonight for this really important event and very timely event. We have, um, just so you all know, this is being live streamed. So we're being recorded. It's being live streamed right now. And it'll be available on our YouTube channel on the Washington Innocence Project YouTube channel after today if you'd like to share the link or share that what you're learning and hearing tonight with anyone. Um, but before we get too much into the program, I just want to start um, by acknowledging that we're on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. So I personally have lived and worked in Seattle and on this land for the last 30 years. And one of the things that I do to acknowledge and, and honor that is to make a monthly donation to Real Rent Duwamish. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that, it's printed on your program, so please do that. And wherever you live and work, if it happens to be someplace other than Seattle, we really encourage you to look into and learn about the first people of, those org of, of that land and to do what you can to individually to support them. So thank you. Thank you for that. My name is Lars Zaroski. I'm the executive and policy director for the Washington Innocence Project. And for those who don't know, we are a statewide organization that works in all of the counties across Washington state to investigate and look into and litigate cases of actual innocence. Um, we also take what we learn from those cases of wrongful conviction forward, move it forward into um, working on policy reform to try to make the system as fair and equitable as possible for everyone, not just those who are actually innocent of the crime they're committed, of the, of the crime of which they were convicted. And so, I do, basically, in other words, we come in when the system has completely failed by every definition, no matter how conservative. Um, but the, as the panelists that are here to talk with us tonight can help to illustrate, our system fails on a lot of different levels and in a lot of different ways. And so we have an obligation to carry this forward and to have this conversation to try to examine what parts of the system can be adjusted, can be fixed, can be addressed, or even just looked at more closely so that we can understand how things are happening the way that they are, why the res we're getting the results that we do, and then what we can do about that. So I'm really incredibly grateful to all of the organizations that are here partnering with us today, um, and I really look forward to introducing Felicia Hudson in just a moment from the Federal Way Black Collective, who's going to um, allow everyone to introduce themselves, but she'll be moderating our panel tonight. But just to give just a, a, a little bit of a background so that we're all kind of in the same place um, in terms of understanding the role of the prosecutor and what, what prosecutors are and how they work in our system. It's really simple. We can sum it up in, in one simple sentence that elected prosecutors, there's 39 counties in Washington state, each county has an elected prosecutor. And that individual, that one elected office is responsible for bringing all criminal charges for any conduct that is alleged to have happened in that jurisdiction. And that's a pretty, it's a pretty broad definition, it's pretty easy to understand, but to really unpack what that means is, is something that I want us to try to take a, a moment to do. Having the ultimate authority for charging decision means that that one person who is elected into office has the authority to decide everything after a criminal, in, or after a police investigation has been turned over to the office of the prosecutor. They have the decision to decide who to charge, how many people to charge, whether they're going to charge a felony or a misdemeanor, or whether they'll bring charges at all. They have the authority to offer diversion options. They have the option to simply not bring charges of any kind related to that conduct. So this is just, it's a really important, it's important to understand, I think, that so much of what we hear um, when we see press conferences and that sort of thing is like, well, it was out of our hands. We, we couldn't have prosecuted this. We had to have prosecuted this. And I would just like to challenge that, that there may be political reasons that things may or may not did have to happen or, or couldn't have happened. But when it comes down to the law and to the authority that's vested in that office, that individual is ultimately responsible for what happens in terms of criminal charges in that jurisdiction. So that's a lot of power, that's a lot of authority, and it's a lot of responsibility, and it has huge impacts on entire communities, without question. So I think that what a lot of people don't understand, what we've learned that a lot of people maybe just don't know, is that those offices are elected offices, and really the one check that we have on the prosecutorial power 
is the power to vote that person out of office every four years. If we don't like what they're doing, if we don't think that how they're choosing to prosecute cases is a reflection of our community standards. And that really is the only check. And I, th I think that there, well, while there are, it's not something I think, while there are ethical standards that are in place, we have, as attorneys, there are rules of professional conduct that govern all attorneys within the state. There's a special rule for prosecutors. It's RPC 3.8. And you can go onto the bar's website and take a look at all the disciplinary actions against any attorney, and you can search by RPC. So you can go to the state bar's website, you can search by RPC 3.8 and see the list of all the attorneys who have been disciplined under violating the rules of professional conduct that, are, uh, that all prosecutors operate under. And I have been having this, I think, I don't know how long, at least 12 or 13 years I've been checking that list when I have conversations like this in t with the community. And um, up until about four years ago, there was one person on that list. One person had been suspended for six months based on withholding information that should have been turned over to the defense during a manslaughter or a homicide case. And the second one was the elected prosecutor in Pierce County in 2018 related to an interview on Nancy Grace. So there's, at the end of the day, since 1984, we have exactly two prosecutors who have been disciplined under the ethics rules. That may be surprising or maybe not surprising, depending on how you look at it, but from our perspective, looking at sort of post-conviction, looking back on the cases that we see people making requests for assistance and the kinds of cases that move forward and the kinds of conduct that we're able to see with the hindsight of 2020, I can say that that is, for us, nothing short of shocking. And so it's a really important responsibility of being part of a community from our perspective to really understand the role of prosecutors and how those decisions that come out of those offices are impacting our communities individually. And we really have an obligation to look at the impact that those prosecutions are having, whether they're equitable, whether they are a reflection of what we want as community. So, this fall, there are a number of prosecutor races across the state. There are very often, every fall, I wanna say seven of the races are contested races where there's actually a choice of candidate. And these are races that are happening all over the state of Washington. We're not here to talk about any particular race. But it's just an important, uh, it's an important conversation for us to have. And each one of these panelists that we have up here that I'm so honored have taken the time to join us tonight um, are going to have, uh, have a really important perspective on the power of the prosecuting attorney and what that role means. So without further ado, I'm gonna to introduce to you Felicia Hudson, who's gonna be our moderator for this evening, and she will allow the, the panelists to introduce themselves. Thank you. Hello, everybody, welcome. My name is Felicia Hudson, and I am the program coordinator for the Federal Way Black Collective. Um, I am now going to introduce our panelists, um, actually, and let them introduce themselves and describe um, what they do. Um, my name is Anthony Powers. I'm the executive director of the American Equity and Justice Group, uh, data focused to create transparency in the criminal justice system around judging, judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and make it available to the public. I'm also the directory of reentry programs at the Seattle Clemency Project. I was hired to build out the reentry system, and now I, I run a staff to help people who are reentering society after 15 years or more. Hi, my name is Anita Candelo, and I am the director of the King County Department of Public Defense. That was so succinct, Anita. That was amazing. I don't know. How you, uh, my name is David Hippard, and uh, it was though. Uh, my name is David Hippard, and. Uh, the title is executive director, but we, we try to dismantle the, the, the hierarchy and the power dynamics in that. Um, but so it really speaks to the responsibilities I hold more so than any type of power dynamics in our, our, our organization. I do my community work through the Freedom Project, and we support the healing, the trauma, and dismantling the impacts of mass incarceration. We, it's, that's, we do that in a lot of different ways. We have, we have workshops inside of the institutions across the state. We, do, we help support folks in transition as they come back to our community. Um, we do anti-oppression workshops, which I think is pivotal to, to this work, because our goal isn't just to help support in these different areas, it's to actually dismantle oppressive systems, and that's what we try to show up the space to do. Thank you. This is an amazing panel of people. I, uh, my name is Stephen Thomas. I am a former King County prosecutor. I was a line prosecutor 
I also spent a couple years working on Dan's executive team. Uh, and then after that, I worked for an organization that trained prosecutors throughout the country. Uh, I now work as a defense attorney in King County, Pierce County, and all over Washington State. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Good. I'm first and foremost, I'm married to the most amazing woman in the world, who's my gift from God, my angel from heaven, the love of my life, the woman of my dreams. If she's live streaming, I want to make sure you know I definitely did um, what it is I'm committed to doing. And I have two great children, a 14-year-old daughter named Hope and a 20-year-old son who's a college student at Central Washington University. Um, he's also just an absolute gift. And I steward a nonprofit in our community called Choose 180, where we work to transform systems of injustice and support the young people who have been impacted by those systems. It's our conviction that young people are possibilities to be developed and not problems to be solved. That grace is the greatest motivator for behavior change and, and far exceeds the possibility that guilt can create. And that together we can transform the system um, through this lens of grace by holding each other accountable on a journey towards healing. Um, thank you so much for joining us in this space on this evening. It's hard to follow that. Um... My name is Tara Simmons, and I am the mother to Dominic Jones, who is in boot camp right now in the Marines, and I'm really sad about it, but um, I'm also uh, the director, co-founder of the Civil Survival Project, which is an advocacy and legal organization led by and for people who have been incarcerated. Um, we do organizing and advocacy at the legislature and also um, provide legal services for people who have been incarcerated around record vacating, legal financial financial obligations and other collateral consequences. Um, I'm also the first formerly incarcerated state legislator. I am a state representative for the 23rd Legislative District. Hard to follow that. <laughs> I'm Jeff Robinson. I'm a criminal defense lawyer from here in Seattle and I founded uh, an organization called the Who We Are Project and that is dedicated to making sure that all of us reckon with the truth about our history of anti-black racism in America. That's it, Jeff? He's also a legend. He's a legend yeah. criminal defense attorney as well. <laughs> um, my name is Michelle I'm Becchiani, and I am the senior legal and policy advisor at the Cook County State's Attorney's Office in Chicago. Um, prior to that, I have a background in police reform. Uh, prison reform, criminal justice reform, voting rights access for individuals who have experienced incarceration, and integrating technology with access to legal representation. So I was brought into this office to really throw stones from the inside, because usually I'm the one suing. So it's good to be it's interesting to be on the other side. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so much for those wonderful introductions. Um, so we're going to start with our questions. Um, it is the duty of prosecutors to seek justice, not just convictions. What does justice mean today? Um, I'm going to start with uh, Tara. What is your <laughs> definition of justice today? Uh, well, I mean, my definition of justice is healing. Um, you know, I think that our criminal legal system is um, not doing much of that. Uh, I often think as a legislator, you know, there's a lot of efforts to change our criminal legal system from sentencing to bail. All of these decisions are made by humans. And it's, you know, right now the prosecutor owns, has the most power. And there's efforts to increase judicial discretion. But I don't know if I'm in favor of that either, to tell you the truth. Um, I think judges are also elected um, and will face the same political challenges. Uh, it, it, in my experience, it, it really does come down to politics. And um, I'm learning that a lot as a legislator. Uh, I thought I'd go inside and just change it all. And yeah, not so much, not as fast as I want it. Um, because elected officials are accountable to the community. And, and this is where everyone here tonight has a responsibility in, in teaching your, in learning about our injustices in the criminal legal system and teaching your neighbors and your community members because our, the public um, still buys into this narrative about um, uh, you know, this fear mongering and then that leads to media and that leads to pressure on elected officials, whether they're a prosecutor or a judge. Um, so, you know, as I'm thinking more about justice as healing and 
um, being incarcerated and everybody that I was with also had severe tr trauma histories. And what, why were they you know, committing um, behaviors that um, landed them incarcerated? It was because of untreated trauma. And so when I think about you know, survivors needing healing, I think that the defendant needs healing too. And I think as a legislator, I'd rather just prescript all of that instead of giving judges or prosecutors discretion. That's a great answer. Um, is there any other panelists that would like to jump in? Yes. Yeah, I'm, when I think of justice, because I kind of look at it in a historical context, um, specifically as we think of racism, convict leasing, so forth, how that transitioned from the 13th Amendment, um, I really think of how do we have a system, and I don't like to say it's broken because it was designed to do what it was intended to do, um, a system in which if a person walks into a courtroom, the historical marginalization of his demographic doesn't play a critical role in how we view him, the level of humanity, the level of compassion, and more so even culpability as we think about the adultification of black boys and girls. And so for me, when I think of justice, it's something that pulls all of that out, whether that is something that can be achieved within one administration, two administrations, it's something that has been around for over a century, but I think justice in an ideal world is kind of almost like an erasure of those hardships, but also maintaining, keeping us cognizant of what contributes to how we view marginalized communities, black and brown communities when they enter into the courtroom. Absolutely, and um, justice is equitable, you know, in a word, right? And, and so, so when you see folks talking about um, their solutions to some of these problems in this injustice system, right, and it doesn't include um, retroactivity, it's not justice, right? The, re the reality is if you're not willing to heal the harms mm -hmm. that, that, have already been, that have already happened and, and pretend like it's, it's equal, equality, right? Like well, we, from, from now on, we can do it like this, this, that, and the other. That's not justice either because you have to really think about the harms that have already happened. They've already thrown our kids away, you know what I mean, um, through mass incarceration, through the early, late 80s and early 90s. And now they don't want your kids thrown away, you know what I'm saying, for those, well, not your kids, but for your kids thrown away, you know, dealing with these opium uh, um, epidemics and crises. And so I just really want to always hinge on the fact, like if it's not retroactive, it's not justice. Yeah, and, 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 and last thing I'll, I'll add, um, first thing that came to mind for me is, see, I have this issue, I eat my food way too fast. Right? I have a hard time chewing my food. And part of this is like, because when I grew up, right, there was like a race to get to seconds, right? Because you wanted to make sure you got enough food. And so we didn't have a lot of food. So the race was always to get to seconds. Now I am a grown man and I, do not have an issue like getting enough food at this point, especially during this pandemic. I've had way too much access to lots of food. But like, but I still eat at like this rabid pace because of the trauma of needing to hurry up and get as much food on my plate as possible. Now, now see for me, justice, right, is not just being aware that I no longer have to hurry up and eat all the food on my plate, but be in a safe space around people who I know will, won't be after the same things that I'm after. And also, had the confidence built up from within that I can do something a different way and get better results. But there's lots of unlearning, there's lots of learning, and lots of space that needs to be created for all of that to be made manifest. And that doesn't just happen because we've elected the right person or we have the right people in political position. It happens because we have a community that's invested in a new narrative that allows all of us to get what it is we need to survive without having to build up responses that have us fighting for the mere morsels that have historically been available to us. Mm. That's good. Okay, we have one more. Well, I, I worked at a job as a prosecutor where I was told it was my job to do justice. I mean, we got paid every single day. We got up and said, we're going to do justice. Uh, but no one defined for that what it, what it was. And so in order to find out what justice meant, I had to look to what, what's, what's the culture like? What do they value? And at the time when I was a prosecutor, this was in 2012, 2013, what was valued was going to trial. And when you went to trial, you were going to trial on the harshest sentences, on, 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 the, on the most charges possible, and you're seeking the highest sentence possible. And so that, in my, in my mind, is what justice meant at that time. And what I had to find out is that I couldn't find a definition of justice inside of the legal system. It really is something I had to look to philosophers and, and spirituality in order to find out what justice really meant. And I love what Cornel West said, that justice is what love looks like in public. 
And when I think about what, just, what, what love looks like in public, I think about healing harm that has been caused to someone. Mm -hmm. I think about this case that I'm working on right now where a young man accidentally shot his friend. It was an accident. They were playing with a gun. How they got a gun is a question we should be asking, but they were playing with a gun. He accidentally shot his friend. And the prosecutors are now pressuring this young man to go to prison for years and threatening him that if he doesn't go to prison, they're going to go to, they're going to, go to trial on, on murder too. They're going to be seeking the highest sentence possible. And I'm asking myself, is that justice? Right. But they're telling this family of this young man that justice is going to be getting this sentence. Justice is going to be sending this young man to prison. And no one's talking about what does healing look like in this situation. Mm. What does healing look like for this family, for this family who lost their loved one? Yeah. And what does it look like for this <clears throat> young man whose life is now also going to be thrown away? He's a 17-year-old boy. Mm. Can I just follow up on that really quickly? Uh, there's a man, <clears throat> excuse me, in Norway. I'm going to mispronounce his last name. It's Anders Breviak. And he killed 77 people in Norway, including a bunch of teenagers. <clears throat> and when he was coming to sentencing, I was monitoring this from over here, and I was looking at the newspapers, and they said this was the worst act of terrorism in the country of Norway since World War II. Mm -hmm. And at his sentencing, lots of people had lots to say, and the judge ended up giving him the absolute maximum sentence, 21 years. Now, he would have gotten either a needle or consecutive lives without parole over here 77 times. So what is it that causes the people of Norway to look at that crime and say, we are horrified and we're putting him away for, seven, for 21 years? And what causes us to look at a similar crime and say, we're either gonna execute that person or bury them under the prison? And there are a lot of people from the American legal system that have gone over to Norway to talk to folks. And what the folks in Norway say is, we haven't othered a group in our country like y'all have in America. And that's what lets you impose these sentences where we would never even think of imposing something like that. And that always got my attention because you can't say Norway doesn't care about their citizens, that they don't have excellent health care, excellent schooling, excellent mental health care. <clears throat> they clearly care about their citizens, but something tells them 21 years is enough instead of death or life without parole. Mm. And that, you know, is a great segue to my next question, actually. Um, do we need to redefine our understanding of what it means to do justice so that restorative justice, which has been shown to improve public safety and better meet the needs of victims, is centered? So I will call on, um, let's see, Stefan. Let's see. I mean, absolutely. I mean, the reality is, is that we know that restorative justice works. There's an organization in Brooklyn called Common Justice. They have been doing restorative justice with violent cases, so robberies and assaults, for over a decade now. They, it, it's proven to show that it works. Uh, it is a model that can be replicated around the country. And the only reason we do not have that is because we, because we have politicians who lack the political will and courage in order to make it happen. So it's not a matter of us not knowing what the solution is. It's a matter of us not willing to actually put our money and resources behind it. But we have an opportunity right now, we have thousands and thousands of cases of a backlog in King County. We could be, and two years ago, we all agreed that this system was racist. Everyone stood up on May 25th last year, hey, this system is racist. But when it comes to this backlog, we wanna put all these cases through this very racist system that we've all agreed upon. That makes no sense. We know restorative justice works. There are models around the country we could bring right here to King County. Mm. Why are we not doing that? It's because some people are not making decisions in order to make that happen. Talk about it. <laughs> Would you like to speak to that as well? I mean, you want me to drop the mic for him? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say it's not just the decision maker as it pertains to the elected official. We have to realize with campaign finance, uh, you know, we have to realize that that controls elections. How much money, there's a reason why we measure probability of winning an election with how much money that you've raised. Mm -hmm. And so one thing I always stress, you know, we, I'm in a kind of coalition of all the progressive 
prosecutors across the country are the directors of policies, and one thing that has dominated our conversation is media and communications. You know, as someone who has lobbied and drafted legislation, uh, there's a big difference when we were on the deception bill right after the Safety Act bail reform, got more pushback if we had done it the year following. Everyone knows that you don't do a bill during an election because in our purple districts, we want to make sure we maintain a majority so people have to do more moderate, tough on crime as Democrats to make sure we kept those areas. So when you're thinking about you know, bringing in new initiatives, you still have to be cognizant of kind of the environment and landscape because you can have the best ideas supported while researched, but people that are deciding who they're gonna vote for are not gonna look at your report. They're gonna look at your mailers with a key phrase, four sentences, one syllable each word. And so how do you condense research saying this is evidence-based when I'm just trying to figure out I have 50 people I need to vote for, I don't have time to go to your policy page. And so I think one thing when it comes to prosecutors, I've really been pushing, when we want to have these new innovative ideas, comms needs to be a focus. You, need, you can't have a small shop. We all know what media plays a role from the death penalty, fear mongering from the southern strategy and so forth. We know what roles it played has done that. We've seen how media has shaped, for better or for worse, every single movement that we've had in this country, whether it's Birth of a Nation or Selma. And so I think what's really when it comes to prosecutors bringing an evidence-based programs that are innovative and thoughtful, we have to realize that getting that buy-in is way more important than the prosecutor making that decision mm. because the prosecutor will go where the votes are and where the votes are are the people that actually register to vote. There's a difference. So I, I really stress that if you really want to have those new ideas, you have to get buy-in at a ground level with organizers and so forth. I, I appreciate that because what it affirms is the culpability that we all share, right? I mean, like, our social contract largely dictates the type of practices that come out of the prosecutor's office. Mm. You know, so if, you know, and, and I, I spend a ton of time this year in New Jersey where my wife has been, and they don't actually wait at crosswalks for the thing to change. They just cross the street. <laughs> Right, like in Seattle, we have this really weird thing where we wait at crosswalks, right? When there's no cars or traffic or anything, we just kind of hang out, and but we don't talk to each other, right? Because it's that wouldn't make any sense. And if we do, we say things like we should get lunch sometime, but we don't really mean it. Um, <laughs> but like that's all embedded in like the, the the social contract that is Seattle, right? It like just like the mastery of our semantics of progressiveness, like when you become a resident of Seattle, it comes with your voter's guide. You get to learn all the flashy words and not how to apply them, right? This is all a part of the social contract in Seattle. And so until we evolve our social contract, we'll continue to hold people who are elected to standards that are subpar that cause harm to people who are marginalized communities. But we have to evolve our way of being and thinking about what restorative practice truly is. So often people want to know, well, what's the impact you're having? I could talk about the over 96% of young adults that don't re-engage the criminal legal system within 12 months of participating in our programming. See how quick I said that? I've been saying it so many times, right? And people are like, wow, right? Then give us a fulfilling dollars, right? But beyond like that aspect of it, the criminal legal system does not produce that kind of result. I could like legit roll a log down the street and have greater success than the criminal legal system does at supporting people who have lived incarcerated. Right, like it means nothing, right? Absolutely nothing. If we look at the data points and what happens when you put people inside of jails, prisons, and release them back to community, absent of support, resources, or any type of rehabilitation or healing process, we're not creating safer communities. But we invest in that narrative because we bought into the propaganda and our social contract reaffirms all of that. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue to push a log up the hill and figure out what I can do with it. In the meantime, we'll continue to vote progressively but act conservatively and then like quietly push people off our sidewalks because we don't want to embrace the fact that their humanity is so close to our humanity that could be us too. Mm -hmm. Right? Like I think like it takes a lot more than to center restorative practices. We have to live in a restorative way and be restorative in our communities in order for any of that to really and truly make a difference. And the last thing I'll say is that we could have young people re-enter community, old people re-enter community, but if we don't have a restorative mentality, we're not creating opportunities for them to thrive in the communities that they're re-entering into. Mm -hmm. This is an embodiment that's more than an elected role. It's an embodiment that needs to be an electorate, yeah. which is each and every one of you. Absolutely, absolutely. Can we just get a snap to that? I'm like, <laughs> all right. So, um, what can prosecutors do with the power they have to improve and encourage safety and justice in the communities they serve? 
Um, Anthony, would you like to address that? Yeah, I'm, I'll go outside the box on this one, right? <laughs> uh, because what they don't think about when they, when, they, when they hand out these sentences that are 40, 50, 60 years, I mean, I just did a resentencing for a guy who had 54 years for uh, stealing a bunch of guns. I knew another guy who had 34 years for stealing his roommate's guns and gave, gave the guns back and apologized, but the police to, uh, had already filed a report and the prosecutor charged him and got 34 years. So what they don't think prosecutors, when they're making these decisions is, is how people influence others while they're incarcerated. Mm. So if you, if you have a bunch of time like that, you have no incentive of trying to do better for yourself, then except in extraordinary cases, people can be that negative influence. And I've seen it where people gave up, they give up and they become that negative influence and then they have to wait for somebody else to come along and be that positive influence. There was a guy named Russell Tronell went in for a nonviolent crime. And being how prison was at the time, uh, you know, because the system started changing, uh, people started getting more proactive uh, in there, people were incarcerated. But how he was influenced by people who had these hundred and something year sentences uh, and hadn't killed nobody, uh, he ended up joining the gang himself. And he was from Centralia, where there was no gangs at the time. So when he joined the gang and he was released on his nonviolent crime, then that opened up drug routes because he, st he started the gang in Centralia that he joined. It was a gang uh, out of California that, that was big in uh, Yakima and Ochenos. And it opened up drug routes from Yakima to Centralia. And those drug groups uh, spread from Centralia to Hoquiam. And then they spread from Hoquiam to Aberdeen. So this is how one person was influenced negatively in prison by people who had no hope because they had these excessive sentences. So imagine if we had a more balanced approach to where you're still holding people accountable, but you're not giving them these excessive sentences. So they still have some hope and some meaningful life outside of prison if they did get this stuff together. And then they're not having those type of influences on people who are coming in for these nonviolent crimes are gonna be getting out anyway, right? So they never think the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the long-term consequences, the ripple effects of these excessive sentences when it goes beyond just keeping this one individual away from society. 97% of people are getting out of prison and the people who aren't getting out still have influence over those who do. Mm. Um, no, go ahead. Anita, go ahead. would you like to speak to that? Oh, I was, I, I was gonna actually just offer some like, so from the, uh, as I said, I work um, at the Department of Public Defense and there are a lot of, I think just small, I mean, seemingly small things that prosecutors could do, um, which would fall sort of in the bucket of giving up a little bit of their discretion, making commitments to follow certain practices and policies. They could decide never to file charges to auto decline a kid. They could decide no. never to um, uh, ask for a higher sentence if someone goes to trial. Mm -hmm. they, could, they could stop punishing people for exercising their constitutional rights. They could do, right, they could make commitments to do this make those commitments public and follow through on those commitments. Absolutely, and to, to piggyback, um, there's a lot that they can do right now as far as with the 6164. They can release folks right now and not, and not lean on criteria that really uh, recreates the same dynamics that got us in the mess in the first place, you know what I mean? Taking folks off the, off the shelf and not under consideration because of something like, because of the crime, the crime category, instead of really looking at the situation and the circumstance and the person, I think that's, that's impactful. And to talk about when we talk about, um, when they talk about safety, right? That's always impactful because then you ask about who's, right? Mm -hmm. Whose safety are they talking about? Um, when, when something happens and they bring out all these police and, 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 and put them so that you, you could see them in every corner and all that other stuff, that's a, that's a psychological thing. That's for folks and those, some of those businesses and folks with resources to feel safer. It don't make you safer. It, does, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't solve any real problem. It's just, it's, just, um, it's, it's just something for a psychological benefit, you know what I mean? And, but when we're talking about actual safety, um, not much is actually done because a lot of the work that has been done, especially historically, has really, um, has really uh, corrupted our opportunities in our community to be, feel safe and to be safe, right? It doesn't help when you decimate a community, you know what I mean? And so when I say, when you say that what they can do, there's a lot of things they can do, mm. you know what I mean? And there's a lot of things they should do, 
you know what I mean? But I think was what's really important is for them to stay centered in the fact to approach this work like we approach this work. I try to work myself out of a job. Mm. You know what I mean? All my solutions though, doesn't come with me at the center of it. Mm. You know what I mean? The reality is the hope is that you'll never need an organization to have to give this type of support or to give this type of help. The hope is that you won't need these type of supports, right? And so, but what the problem is sometimes when you have folks that are in systems, all their solutions are around them always existing, mm. right? And that creates messed up dynamics, and that also creates circumstances where you can't actually solve the problem. You won't have enough imagination because you don't, you don't want to mess up your budget, right? And so at the end of the day, I think there's a lot they can do. I think what's important is to dismantle itself, right? And try to invest in the communities that they profess to serve and the profess to support, because that's the support that we need. The one thing that you see about folks when they get out and they do amazing, they do amazing because they got resources. Uh -huh. They got resources, there's no magic bullet. You know what I mean? I talk about some of these, a lot of these classes and programs on the inside and they want, you know, it is what it is. And a lot of, and they good. And they good if they create spaces where empathy happens and folks can do the work that they need. But I'm gonna be real with you. There's probably like 10 organizations that are taking credit for how I showed up when I got released, right? The, the, the reality is, it's, it's I was able to get empathy on the inside with, and folks were getting support around me. And sometimes you go to these programs and these classes because that's where that support is. And some of these folks, all these folks, have taken all these classes. You know what I mean? It's not the class, it's the person. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so at the end of the day, I think that that's what we need to really focus on. Um, um, so, you know, we have to decenter systems. We have to center community and really make that investment because that's the problem. The, the difference between a community with a lot of crime and a community with none isn't more police, it's more resources. Thank you. See, when I left the advocacy space to join the prosecutor's office, and it was a bit intimidating because it's the second largest prosecutor's office in the country, um, with a very notorious history, the same office that authorized the execution of Fred Hampton. Um, one thing, the first day, State's Attorney Fox told me, culture eats policy for breakfast. Mm -hmm. And that was the most realist statement, now looking back, that I see. You know, and one thing I've always pushed back is when we say, what can prosecutors do? Not realize there's, each prosecutor has their own prosecutorial discretion. So even if we are to put a policy out front, this is how you should exercise your discretion, just as the Constitution says, this is how, what probable cause looks like, and so forth, implementing oversight and enforcement is additional resources. So we have 750 attorneys in our office. We say, this is our policy, you're doing X, Y, Z. What does the oversight and accountability look like to ensure that we're enforcing it? Because we have plenty of laws. Just like you said, you're not supposed to jaywalk. You still jaywalk. You know? <laughs> like, so it's like we have laws that people are breaking. How do we enforce it? And so if this is a policy. How do we enforce it? And you can't do it just by laying the hammer down. You have to shift the culture. And this culture is not going to happen in one term or two terms. This is culture that is so deeply embedded in this history of this country and not just the county. And I'll end on this note when it comes to, because someone brought up, uh, we call it automatic transfer, where you go into a, adult court. Um, so I am really, I love reading legislative transcripts, what the debates that happen on the floor. And um, you see in the 1980s, 1982, is when we introduced automatic transfer. It used to be include drugs, so certain drugs kids would be charged as adults and so forth. When you listen to the floor debate, you see the culture. And that culture is not coming from the profession or them as legislators. It's coming from how they were raised in their community. It's coming from the conversations that they have on the dinner table. It's coming from living in communities where they never even interacted with people that are actually within the system, that are overwhelmingly black. That's where it comes from. So when I go into a correctional facility, I see nothing but black boys, and I see white men that don't even live in the city of Chicago, that culture, is what's going to, what you're going to see. And so I always, when I think about what we can do as prosecutors, it's not just what we can do as prosecutors, but what can we do when we are not even in the office? How can we change how we look at the world and each other as a whole? Because if I see you as less than, me going into my office is not gonna change the way I see you. <laughs> it may change the office that I'm in and what I'm wearing, but it's not gonna change how I view you and the level of humanity that I afford you. Yeah, um, I actually heard a prosecutor, because we do a lot of resentences, right? So uh, we work with them occasionally. And I heard a prosecutor say, 
yeah, uh, we might not be sending a lot of people to prison right now, but that's going to change after the pandemic. And my response was, well, if you can come up with excuses and not send somebody to prison during the pandemic, then why can't you come up with those same excuses outside of the pandemic? Mm -hmm. I think the, the, <clears throat> the point about culture is really important, and this is where uh, blindness to what's going on in front of you is really powerful. And so I saw a stat that looked at over 125,000 drug possession cases in King County from 1999 to 2019, <clears throat> 20 years. 40% of the prosecutions were of black folks. Black folks made up 7% of the population. White folks made up 67% of the population and 50% of the drug cases were against white folks. That is culture. You can say the police are the ones bringing the cases, and that's right, the police are the ones deciding who to arrest. But there's a culture that says, when I sit charging drug cases, and I see that 7% of the population is making up four out of every 10 cases I charge, maybe I should do something different. Maybe there's a problem here. Maybe we have to stop prosecuting drug possession cases until we figure out why this is going on. And quite frankly, it ain't that complicated. When you have a living room in Bellevue, you can sit in your living room and get high. If you have to go outside and do it in the street, and the police are driving by, then you're a much easier target. Nobody in this room thinks that the students at Bellevue High School do less drugs than the students at Rainier Beach High School. We all know that's not true. So these numbers are telling us something that it doesn't matter if this is intentional or by accident. It is broken. And there is a culture that lets somebody sit at a desk and file these cases day after day without looking and saying, why do the numbers look this way? Mm, that's good. All right, moving on to the next question. Um, let's see, what can we do to change the current narrative about criminal justice so that more police arrests and incarcerations keep us safe? Stop asking questions like that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what says more police and more arrests are going to keep us safe? No, it's not going to keep us safe. I mean, if we had, if we didn't learn that through the mass incarceration era, then you know I don't think we'll ever learn it. Um, you can't arrest yourself out of the problem when the problem isn't uh, rooted in that. It's uh, like like the brother uh, David was saying. It's it's based off of resources, and we need to address things at the root cause, and not thinking we're going to arrest our way out of it. Tara, would you like to address that? Yeah, I mean, how do we change the narrative? It's, um, you know, I we do a good job. I think some of us here, formerly incarcerated, David, Anthony, uh, you, you know, we, we share our stories. Um, we uh, work with folks who do a lot of um, media and communications. There's a great documentary out called Since I've Been Down Right Now. It's been showing everywhere. You know, we're trying to educate the community because it's really hard because right now we see it in the media every single day. Um, you know, crime is up and then, you know, you've got people all on social media saying, you know, the police aren't doing anything and this happened to me and it's just, it's out of control right now and it makes it really hard to do the work I want to do, which is, um, you know, bring more humanity and healing into our criminal legal system at the policy, at the legislative level when you have this narrative going out around that, somehow crime is up and police and incarceration is the um, response that's needed. And that's what some people are demanding. And so we have to become more educated as a, a community as a whole and educate more people and somehow get them to come and see our culture and where we live and our lived experiences. And, um, you know, one thing we're working on right now is creating a, a 
political action committee that hopefully can do some of that education across Washington state. It, there is never been a PAC in Washington that has been educating voters about the criminal legal system and educating legislators and prosecutors as they're running for office about these particular issues. And so I'm really excited about that. Uh, but in the meantime, we just keep sharing our stories about the truth and, you know, what we've been through and, and, and that we're not um, animals, you know. Absolutely. Um, uh, I would say, I think that's important work. Narrative change work is, is, is probably the most important. I think these same narratives have been going generationally, like these are for a long time. I think since, since Reconstruction, they've been, they've been um, having these narratives about our community and we're still reaping the, 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 the ramifications. For those, for those, for those narratives, and they they were they they criminalized our community, right? You know, we talk about the Southern strategy, and we talk about the war on drugs, and we talk about these things, and and if and if you look at it, the reality is, I th folks still inherently believe that 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 with you black and brown, that you're criminal, mm. right? And the laws reflect this. The way you deal with retroactivity, it's all reflected in our policies and all this other, and so. I think that folks got to be able to do their internal work to understand their biases and how that shows up in the way that they vote and the way that they they they, they have they, they sculpt policy and the, and what they advocate for and and stuff like that. I, but, but I think it's it's also we have to be careful of, of about our language and how we we hold it in place. You know what I mean? We talk about folks like you talk about when of folks get folks being rehabilitated. Right, and this is a concept, and the, and the idea is that somebody went in there and, and they were a bad person, and they, they got this 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 class or they got this experience, and now they were able to re, re, be rehabilitated, and they're now they can come into re-enter re society and not be a criminal and all this other stuff of framing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and 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 so what you don't realize, even if you're talking about criminal justice reform, you're still holding the pieces together that that keeps it in place because it's still this dynamic, like there's something wrong, you know what I'm saying, with these folks who are getting uh, 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 decimated in these streets and getting incarcerated, you know what I'm saying? We, we believe people change, we don't, we don't believe people change, we believe they heal, you know what I mean? I like to put that in the space because I think it's, a, it, it's, it's really a paradigm shift on how we, we, we view our community and understanding that folks need to heal, they don't need to change, because if a person needs to change, the implication is that something's wrong with you, and, then, and, we, and, and, and something needs to happen to be right with you, you know? And so at the end of the day, I think a lot of these narratives need to change, um, but it's gonna be tough sledding because it's not just education. I promise you it's not just education. Seattle is the most educated and fluent when it comes to racial equity lingo on the planet. It is for real. There's folks in this space that can spit it better than me. <laughs> but if you watch how they vote, and if you watch the policies they push, and the strategies that they come, they, 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 they come up with when they're talking about issues with our community, you wouldn't know the difference. Mm. And so it's bigger than education. You know what I mean? We gotta do our internal work and we gotta do that work and, we, and, I, and I hope we can do it collectively because we're all in this together. We all have something to gain. But at the end of the day, those, that's the only way we're gonna be able to really change these narratives. Absolutely. I see, I see several people, everybody's got their mics up. Like, <laughs> I'm ready. Just really briefly, so for me when it comes to like, the thing that I've known, it's money. It really is money and so when I was in juvenile court, I really saw how societal ills fall on the backs of the criminal justice system. And we've seen a lot of times the narrative is, oh, we have to hold these kids accountable for what they're doing, yet we don't hold ourselves accountable for making sure they don't enter the system in the first place. Mm. And now we want to talk about accountability when our failures have led to them being there. And to give two concrete examples that I saw in my courtroom was, we had a young person was accused of, you know, a violent act, a very violent act, um, and he was just very, very disruptive while in the detention center. He had his first mental health screening while in detention center. They found he had bipolar schizophrenia. Mm. Took his medication, they gave him medication, night and day report, I was like, well, you think? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's just crazy, it took him being detained and incarcerated to get services. Mm. On the tail end, I had another young, young person he is on probation. On probation, you get all these services, like, I mean, better than most of some of our schools. And he had an educational advocate that was with him, tutored, and so forth. 
he gets to court, congratulations, you finished probation, you did a great job, and he asks the judge, can I stay on probation? Because he says, I don't want to lose my educational advocate. And so it's gotten to the point that our kids feel like being criminalized is the only way that we care for them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing that really disrupts me a lot, that we're throwing so much money into the criminal justice system, into our pri one of our highest graduation rates is at the, the high school at the, at the uh, Department of Juvenile Justice. You get all the services there. But what about our schools that don't even have libraries? Right. Or mental health counselors, when they're losing their friends left and right and you're expecting them to go to school and focus and wait for the part-time counselor to come next week? And so for me, it's just like we need to stop putting everything on the system and hold ourselves accountable because it's so easy to be like, well, this kid's bad. Hold him accountable. I was like, well, because you haven't been doing anything from the first 13 years of his life. What do you expect? Mm -hmm. So I really think it's like, again, pushing it, a holistic approach of it's not just a system, but we need to get our act together and stop putting it on the kids. There's also like, I, I, I want to continue to bring it back to the collective us and all of you. Um, folks like David Hephard are constantly doing this emotional activity of short, sharing his story, dehumanize the experience of people who are living incarcerated so you can see them as fully human. That's an insult that David has to share so much of his lived experience in order to coax people along a journey mm. to understand the humanity of those who are living incarcerated. How many times do I have to answer the question, give me a success story of your organization? Give me an example of a young person who's been successful as a result of your work. What you want me to do is tell you a story about a young person to justify your leaning that there could possibly maybe be a way that's better than the way that hasn't worked historically time and time again. We need to get to a place as a community where folks who have been impacted don't have to do the emotional gymnastics to impress upon you that we aren't exceptional individuals, we aren't exceptions at all. In fact, our prison system is full of exceptional people who simply haven't had a voice and haven't been seen, who have been invisibilized because it's convenient. And all of us are culpable in that. Not just the prosecutor, not just the police, not the judges, not the elected. All of us are culpable in that. And until we begin to intentionally see our shared humanity, we are going to produce systems that cause similar impact over and over and over again, no matter who we have in office and who's making the decisions, because it's what we'll expect and it's what we'll, those expectations that we'll put upon them. But I, for one, am exhausted of having to convince people of the humanity of folks like me in an effort for you to be able to believe that there's a better way forward. I have to do the first panel disagreement in part. Uh, and that's, you know, there are, there are extraordinary people in the, in the prison system. There are extraordinary people who do things, but that should not be the standard. We should not expect somebody to come out running nonprofits and doing everything things and, you know, uh, making a bunch of money, whatever, whatever, whatever somebody would say is uh, outside of the norm. Cause, because there's people in society who uh, operate on different levels, right? But that shouldn't be the expectation. Somebody should be able to get out, get a basic job, do basic things, live a basic life, and that should be good enough too. Just like it's good enough for people in society. But I will not uh, ignore the fact that I've seen, in my 26 years in prison, a whole lot of extraordinary people. And I've seen a lot of people who just wanna, you know, uh, they're, they're more ordinary. They're not extraordinary, they're ordinary, but they deserve another opportunity as well. I, just a quick, quick retort. Um, I, 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 what I have to say is that I think we are all exceptional people, and I think some of our special is honored more than others based upon the way that we show up in space. As a society, we value folks who are able to communicate the way that I communicate. So regularly, people, when I get done speaking, they're like, man, that was really impressive. But like, I have people who, who serve our cause, who diligently do things that are virtually invisible, that are exceptional at what they're doing, but will never be acknowledged for how exceptional they are because it's not the type of work that we center in our community as being special. 
And so I think all of us are exceptional. I think the thing about exceptionalism is we pick and choose what it is we think should be an outlier and say, well, that's what we're going to select and say we should elevate and amplify. I think exceptional is the person who shows up and goes home and takes care of their family and makes sure there's food on the table, loves on their kids unapologetically, supports their partner in the, in, in the high times, the low times, everything in between. But that's not a story you're going to see because that story is really normal or it should be normal, but it's not like the types of stories that we put up and we promote. So I hear you, right? I absolutely hear you. And I think we have to be careful about calling out a selective few as being those that stand apart when all of us have something within us that stands us apart. It's just we don't always get celebrated for that particular thing. Whether it's folks who are living incarcerated or folks who are living in this city, there's many of people who have specials that aren't acknowledged. And part of our inability to acknowledge that special is why people end up in the predicaments they're in because they haven't been celebrated for what they do better than most people can imagine doing it. This is the last one because we have a few more questions to go through and I want to make sure that we get through all of our questions. What I saw a lot as a prosecutor is that we differentiate between those who are deserving of resources and help and diversion and those who are not. And a prime example is what, how we treat children, mm -hmm. right? There's certain kids that the prosecutor will stand up all day long and say, we're gonna divert all these misdemeanors, these low level offenses, but if you do something like this, we're gonna charge you adult, we're gonna send you to prison for 40 years. And so there's some children that are deserving and some children that are not. Instead of saying all children are deserving of, of help and hope and healing and be able to recognize your humanity and the ability that you have to overcome your circumstances and to be something, not just uh, David Hebbard and Anthony Powers, but that you have the ability to move beyond that circumstances that brought you to court in the first place. So you can't call yourself a progressive and say, well, there's this, there, I'm going to be progressive on certain things. But when it comes to a practice that we know is rooted and grounded in the history of racism and this racist super predator myth, I'm going to continue that practice. Prosecutors have the ability and the power to choose not to auto decline children. Mm -hmm. They can do that today if they so want to, but they choose not to because they continue to perpetuate this myth that there's some kids that are deserving and some kids that are not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know, right? Can we get, can we get some snaps? Um, <laughs> does our current system, I, that you know, ties into this question too, does our current system need an o overhaul? If so, what's, what are steps we can <laughs> nice take question. to move into a better <laughs> system, right? We kind of yes. answered it, but what are the steps that we can take though? You know, what, what can we do to make it better? Well, I say my colleague, I'm going to call her out, in the office, she's like, just burn it all down. I'm like, you can't say that in this office. <laughs> God, if something happens. But um, I'll, I'm going to be very brief. I don't know. Um, the more and more I dive into it, the more and more I don't know. Mm -hmm. Because it is so sophisticated. And I was saying, it's like a game of whack-a-mole. You think you got something? Oh, boom. Bail from boom. Electronic monitoring. It's like, it's just... It's hard to keep up because you don't even, you're focused so much on this, you don't even anticipate what the next move is. And by then it's already embedded itself and you don't even realize. Mm -hmm. I mean, to see how it has evolved so like seamlessly, I'm just like, you know, talk about it at my eulogy. I don't know. I don't think I'm, you know, doctor saying maybe in my lifetime, but like, I just don't, I, I don't know what an overhaul would look like um, because I don't even know what the whole system looks like. Well, I could take a shot at overhaul. <laughs> Burn it down, right? Just, all it does is take a match and some lighter fluid. No, no, listen, but we want to talk about real substantial steps, right? I think, I think having, we, uh, we understand where we want to get to. We understand that the system was built on something that's rooted in something that creates an obvious result now, right? And that you're gonna have to dismantle this system and reimagine something else if we're gonna have something that can really uh, 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 hold and make space for, for, for all communities and, and everybody in our, in our community, in our population, right? I understand that, but as of right now, we're in a, these systems are in place and they're deeply embedded and they're humongous, right? And so I think as a step is to put folks in these positions who understand their position, right? I think that's important. I think when you put people in there that this is their career, I think you're in trouble. I think if a person, if this is their livelihood and, and, a, and a person's trying to pay their mortgage off this work, they're less likely to, um, to make decisions that would negatively impact their office, regardless of how 
um, how great it is for the community, right? And so I, I think that you're gonna need folks to intentionally understand, just like we understand in this work, like, like we, we talk about, like we're, we understand we're trying to work ourselves out of a job. Mm -hmm. We understand that. I don't have no problem waking up tomorrow and do something else because the problem isn't here anymore. You know, uh, um, and so I think that that's important. That'd be an important step is you being able to get folks to have the understanding that um, we're going to have to dismantle some of these systems if we have a chance of it getting to a place where um, we all want it to be. And so that, that, that's a step. Another, another step is for everybody to do their internal work. I'm trying to tell you that I think that's the important piece of every puzzle because you doing your work impacts everything you do. You know what I mean? You doing your healing work impacts everything you do because you bleeding out, regardless if it's in space or it's at home or it's in the voting booth or whatever the case, impacts everybody. And so you being able to do that type of work and be mindful about who holds these positions in these systems because if everybody ain't on the same accord and really intentional about this process, the system is humongous and it's big and it's gonna keep flowing and then we're gonna have to do that thing at, at Sister's eulogy and stuff like that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but so that's what I think. Thank you. Anita, would you like to speak to that? Um, sure, I, I think um, a little bit of a, of a policy wonkish answer, but um, I think we need to divest, right? I think, um, I think in King County, more than half of the county's budget goes to its criminal legal system. And what would the world look like if we shrunk that, let's say, to a quarter? I mean, and, and hear me say, I think it shouldn't be Eddie, but right, let's, lay, let's say we shrunk it, shrank it in half. And we took all those dollars and we invested them in community. We gave them to, we bought housing. We made sure that every single person in our community had a place to live, a roof over their head. What would that look like? Um, I think it would make for a pretty different world. But instead, we continue to invest deeply in this system that we know is not effective, that we know is racially disproportionate. And we need to stop. That's great. So that kind of leads to my next question. Should prosecutors be held professionally and financially liable for any negligence and or misconduct revealed that was part of the conviction of an innocent individual? That's a big question. I'm not answering. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Um, I don't know. Stephen, would you like this to? This is live stream. Like, on the process. Honor, she process. said this on the record. <laughs> I'll, I'll go for it. I mean, uh, I, I, I would love some help drafting the bill. I mean, I'm just saying, like, this is what we are fighting for in the police um, space right now is qualified immunity and making sure that we can hold people accountable for harms. And I think if you are a prosecutor, you... A prosecutor is a special kind of lawyer, actually. They are they have high ethical standards, not just for... They are, no, they're not representing the victim of a crime, they are representing justice. And when they are intentionally withholding evidence and because they're going for the conviction, that is a, a, that should be really, again, it should violate our social contract in um, a deep way. And I think that prosecutors that do that should be held personally and professionally liable, uh, financially and every which way, and disbarred because um, we are only as good as the people that are working in the system, and if they are doing things like that, they should absolutely be held accountable, and I would love to work on legislation regarding that. Do you think that would impact settlement discussions? I'm curious, if, if in regards to, so if there's now this additional, I'm just, I'm literally just curious, I don't have a position on it, but so like for a bargaining chip, if they were like, okay, well, if this comes with a certain level of liability, I'm gonna fight it even more, as opposed to taking away from that and focusing on you getting a settlement. And I don't know how many of the civil cases go to trial, but I'm just curious if there are more greater, if there are more grave consequences to the prosecutor's office, or is there gonna be even more pushback as it pertains to you know, wrongful prosecution and so forth? I'm just curious about, because I know like, you know, you have, we have insurance, you have the city of police if they there's wrongdoing, and then you have the state if you get amount per, per year, but I'm curious to see what impact unintended consequence there may be as it pertains to settlement negotiations for those who are wrongfully incarcerated. Just, I'm just putting, not to put a question to the question, I'm just curious. 
So if you are a prosecutor and you have willfully withheld evidence or you have committed some willful misconduct, yes, you should be disbarred and held accountable for that. I mean, the reality is I know a prosecutor, I'm thinking them in my mind right now, who convicted an innocent person convicted an innocent person. We know that because it was later found out, I don't know if it was an innocent project, who it was, but they convicted an innocent person. That prosecutor was not held accountable at all for that. In fact, they were promoted and promoted and promoted. There was no discipline internally. There was nothing that happened externally. So that's extremely problematic to have that type of culture in an office. The other thing is, is that we are incentivized, at least when I was a prosecutor, I was told that to really move up the ranks, you got to take tough cases to trial. And that means taking cases to trial that don't have a lot of evidence or are quote unquote tough to prove. Well, those are the kind of cases where people are, are innocent. Well, you can, you can begin to rethink what it means to be a successful prosecutor. Your prosecutor should not be successful based upon how many cases you win or how many cases you take to trial. It should be about whether or not your victims are actually made whole. Whether or not the person who caused harm, you actually address the root causes of why they caused harm in the first place. That you actually move beyond this discussion that is individual wrongdoers that we need to go after and start looking at the systemic issues that led to that person being there in the first place. And so absolutely, if you are a prosecutor who's committing willful misconduct, you should be held accountable for that. We talk about accountability all the time, but when it comes to prosecutors, we don't want to be held accountable. That seems hypocritical. Right. And can I say that, um, you know, I'm not against, I'm, I'm all for that. We should do what they're going to do with all that other stuff. But I, I, I want to also, hi also highlight this, though. Um, it's, it can be dangerous to believe like that's a solution. Mm -hmm. Right. And, 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 and so to, I, I always worry when, when folks come up with, with, with strategies that individualize the problem mm. and make it seem like the problem is just bad prosecutors and not the prosecution as a system, right? And, and, and so I don't want us to take the eye off the ball of, of, of dismantle why this is flowing. So, because just think about it, it's been flowing way too smooth for way too many generations. <laughs> it, this ain't a bad roll of the dice that only bad people become prosecutors. I, just, I think we just need to be real. You know what I mean? Like, this is a system problem. And, and, and we always have to check ourselves and be careful. Are we taking our eye off the ball? You know what I mean? I'm all for that, just to be clear. But I just don't want folks to, to get that, do that, and then do backflips and be like, it's over. Because that's been my experience, mm. is folks take those solutions and then they start celebrating and doing parades and the oppression still happened 50, 60 years later. And so we have to be super intentional of, of the fact that we're trying to dismantle a system, a system of oppression that's been rolling flawlessly for over 400 years. And so we can't take our eye off the ball. That's, I just want to make that. I, one thing I just quickly want to add, I would be careful and leveraging the tools of the oppression to build our way to freedom. And if we, if we then institute a practice of causing some sort of harm to those who have caused harm, then we're not getting out of the harm cycle. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder what does it look like to take the same, re same restorative lens to prosecutors who have caused harm to liberate them from the harm cycle that they're stuck in, in effort for prosecution to be more restorative in its nature. I have a really difficult time saying that our response should be reciprocal to the, to, the, to the action because it seems like that's how we're in this place in the, fir in, in, in the first place. I also believe that we should, we should target some of their, uh, their, their strongest tools. You know, target the one-year time bar. People are expected to learn the law and, and file an appeal in one year, mm. and now they take <laughs> typewriters and, I mean, who uses a typewriter anyway, right? They, but they want to give you a typewriter in prison. They then took the, took the books and shredded them all, you know, and uh, you're expected to, to learn how to file an appeal within one year, and people don't even learn that quickly in law school. Uh, learn the history. Uh, I didn't learn it until I read the book, Just Mercy. A lot of people seen the movie, but what wasn't in the movie was how they're talking about in 1989, the U.S. Supreme Court outlawed uh, victim testimony, not to be against the victims, but it said it was too prejudiced, it was too biased, and then uh, being, being, being uh, put under pressure, the... U.S. Supreme Court three years later reversed their own decision, and right after they reversed their own decision, the federal government 
poured tons of money into state uh, victim advocacy, which was ran through the prosecuting attorney's office, because they know it's more inflammatory and you're gonna get more time out of people. And when it comes time for somebody to be reviewed, then the person is more likely to stay inside of prison, right? So when we look at their tools and we look at their lingo, I believe those are the things that we need to dismantle because those are the strengths that keep the system as it is, right? So when, they, when you hear them and they're talking about retroactiveness, right? Retroactivity, and they say, oh, we can't. We have to have truth and, truth and sentencing, right? <laughs> truth and sentencing. And, uh, but this is just really being deceptive to the community because you know you have that word truth and then people are gonna latch on to that, right? And like, oh yeah, I can, I, can, I can see that, right? But when you look deeper, why isn't there truth in prosecuting? Right, that's, 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 that's the new catchphrase that I'm trying to push, right? <laughs> Truth in prosecuting, because when it comes to prosecutors, I knew a guy who was facing 30 years, they offered him a nine month plea bargain. He didn't take the nine month plea bargain, so he got the 30 years, right? So if he would have been safe for the community in nine months, why is it that he has to do 30 years? Right, so have truth in your own prosecuting to where you're not just threatening people to try to get them to take, take plea bargains to fill up these prisons, but really have a sincere approach that you're, you're, use, you're using taxpayer dollars and you're supposed to be serving the community and there should be some sincerity in that. So I believe that we should uh, uh, address their talking points and dismantle the things that they use to keep the system in place as it is. I'm gonna hashtag truth in prosecuting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I think we've kind of touched on this question. Um, are there any ways we can work towards prison abolition that do not rely on the person slash personality of the individual in the elected prosecutor's chair? Okay, yes. so I'm very passionate about this. <laughs> um, I'm super passionate about this because prisons, so a lot of people don't really, so private prisons, you think federal, but a majority of the portfolios for private prisons are state through state. You have these two major players, GEO, CoreCivic, it was known as CCA, but I think they were trying to do rebranding. So the thing that I always try to tell is again, that kind of hopelessness I feel, because I'm seeing how deep it is, is these prisons rely almost solely on, for operations, debt financing from banks, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Merrill Lynch, and so forth. With debt financing, if you're primarily relying on that, you gotta pay the money back. So literally bodies, Beds, bodies are what's paying these banks back. They have revolving credit. Revolving credit is like an Amex on steroids, but you don't really have to pay your bill. So basically, you can borrow at any time and pay at your own schedule. Yeah. So it's the most ideal setup. And to see that how, so I, I did a presentation, slave market to stock market. And what I've been able to, so I was able to pull all these transcripts from investors' conversations through FactSet where these pri private prisons are talking to investors of how they're gonna make sure they're turning their money over. Now these investors are not just, this is not just banks, we're talking about universities, churches. Like it is wild how much money people have in this. And so as we talk about criminal justice reform, people have, a, it's not just racism, people have a lot of skin in the game when it comes to mass incarceration. A lot of money. So the same banks that were saying about racial equity, they have big portfolios with these prisons. The same ins mutual insurance companies, whatever, who are actually a part of slavery when it comes to collateral, they're also doing in business with these private prisons. And it is so sophisticated how they make sure they meet their bottom line and address their debt. Because you have to pay it back. And then on top of that, they're also buying additional companies with their debt. So do people know what Soberlink is? Before you'd have to like know your probation officer would come in and pass and test if you've been drinking alcohol. Soberlink now is, is a company that you can like blow into something, it comes up on your phone, verifies that it's you. So yeah, it's convenient. You don't have to go with the PO. Oh, but guess what? CoreCivic bought that company up. We're seeing these private prisons buy re-entry houses. And we, even in one transcript, it's so crazy, where it's like this one lady is like, well, now that people are moving towards criminal justice reform, we need to invest more in electronic monitoring. Mm -hmm. We need, now we have all, I mean, it, it is disgusting what these, and this is like public stuff. It's like they're just having these conversations like you're at a book club. Yeah. And so when I think of like decarceration and prison abolition, it's, you ha we have to hold banks accountable. Investors need to hold their banks. What, you're, what is in your portfolio? You need to have some level of contract say, if you're gonna invest my money, I don't want it to go towards these types of companies. Mm. And they're too big fish, so it's not that hard to isolate them. And so 
I mean, they are really dedicated. They're trying to, they, were, they lost a contract in Alabama because of DOJ. And like, literally like, well, how can we help them build a prison? Like, it's, it's disgusting. And, and also ICE detention centers, they have that. So while these universities were protesting against Trump, by the way, your pockets were being lined by the detention centers being used more. Wow. So if we're talking about abolishing prisons, it's not just the frontline workers of correctionals or even politicians. Like big banks have a huge role, and they're about to—they need to get paid. <laughs> so you owe me money, you got to pay me. Figure it out. Yeah, I just want to say, and then they, you know, donate a lot of money to elected officials to, um, you know, get them elected, um, and then that's what drives the sentencing um, bills. But I also want to say that the state is complicit and all of us are complicit in this too because do you know like when you go get your license plates where those were made um you know the state even though we don't have private prisons we are as a state um utilizing uh incarcerated individuals to perform public functions like make your license plates um i wish i could send a a note everybody has to get their you know, tabs renewed or a license plate when they buy a car, you know, along with, um, you know, this was made at Walla Walla prison um, by incarcerated people. How do you feel about that? You know, I, I just, you know, even though we don't have private prisons, we're, we're still making money or saving money as a state based on how many incarcerated people we have, because they're also um, for 42 cents an hour, you know, cooking, cleaning, doing laundry, doing everything that you you should, the state should have to pay at least minimum wage for workers to do. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I understand the private prison argument, but I'd like to see us as a state move forward on, um, you know, talking about some of our budget decisions and how that drives um, sentencing too. And, and I, and I want to say that um, I mean, one of the a, a, an amazing starting point, and I've been saying this, is for us to do our work, man, and understand your biases and what you bring to space. Um, because at the end of the day, um, when folks get released, when policies are being, uh, uh, um, being talked about and, 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 and voted on and, and, and executed, at the end of the day, biases show up. And a lot of energy, and it might not show up as something as you being against something. It might show up in a way where your energy doesn't go to something. You have this inability to see the humanity of folks who actually deal with that level of oppression, right? You, 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 life has put you in a position where you don't have to see or experience some of the things that some folks have to do in our community, right? And so, uh, so you have the luxury and the pleasure and the privilege to, to, to be able to put your efforts somewhere else, maybe in the PTA or something. So what I'm saying is, um, at the end of the day, what I'm saying is us to be able to do our internal work. Because when we see folks not get hired, or when we see folks, it's difficult for folks to find a place, to, a permanent place to stay. And even though they do get hired, a lot of these jobs is entry level jobs. And they got policies where they're okay with hiring you doing entry level work, but you can't be promoted, right? When you see these things show up in, in, in our spaces, all that stuff plays an impact and plays a part, right? And so at the end of the day, we all have to do our internal work. I think we have to heal, right? I think we have to connect to our own humanity and maybe that makes space for us to be able to see the humanity in somebody else. And I think that that's the, probably the most important thing that we can do. Um, the movement is healing. You know what I mean? We can get there, I think we have a chance. If we can't, we're just bleeding our trauma all over each other and that's, and we've seen what, we've been seeing that for 400 years. And that really actually leads to my last question. Uh, what are practical tasks that the public can do to make sure our criminal legal system is actually achieving justice? Don't, achieving justice. Don't treat jury summons like an inconvenience mm -hmm. and, oh, it's something I have to get out of. Take your ass down to the courtroom and sit as a juror. And say and, not guilty. And listen to what's being brought in front of you. <laughs> and listen to the kinds of cases that are being brought. And if you sit as a juror, you have an immediate impact on the life of at least one person in that system. Somebody who is deciding, am I going home or am I going through that other door? So it really irritates me when people complain about the inconvenience of jury service, when it is one of the two things that you have a right to do as a citizen 
jury service, and voting. And it's one of the reasons why racism in jury selection is such a problem, because I actually have a right to sit as a juror in a criminal case or a civil case in this county, because I'm a citizen of this county, and white people can't take that right away from me mm -hmm. by employing practices in jury selection that are deliberately designed to exclude people that look like me. So if you are a progressive, if you are a person of color, if you are somebody that thinks about how important the decisions in this system are made, you can't afford the luxury to turn your face away when you get a jury summons. Sign that thing and take your ass down to the courtroom and make them prove cases to you. I'd love to see our jury um, pay more though because what I find is a lot of people who have you know low wage jobs who come from marginalized backgrounds can't afford to um, go to jury um, duty because they can't afford childcare transportation parking I mean it's how much is it to park downtown Seattle I, you know the, the, your jury stipend doesn't even cover your parking down here so I think that's one thing the elected prosecutor of this county can do um, when they're reelected is get with um, DPD uh, chief defender over there and lobby the freaking county to increase it to a few hundred bucks a day. So it can be something that people have space to do um, despite whatever their economic background is. Anita, would you like to speak to that as well? Oh, uh, I mean, it's just funny because we are, I think, meeting um, in maybe in mid-June this month with the prosecutor and, and the judges about trying to advocate for, for more jury pay. Um, although I think there's a state statute that limits how high it goes that you should fix. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but as important as jury service is to reducing the injustice we see in the system, I want to challenge again the premise of this question uh, you know, that, that there is justice to be achieved in the system at all. It really is a system that needs to be dismantled from which we need to divest and we need to invest in the things that people need in order to live good lives and invest in our community and invest in, in, um, in healing. I was actually talking about this in the green room. It's like my biggest pet peeve since I worked in nonprofits for a fair amount of time. A lot of times it's very, I call it NIPIC, nonprofit industrial complex. Um, it's very easy for like the policy wonks you know, law student, I mean, I'm an attorney, ivory tower where you want to dictate the agenda, foundations. Mm. I want to be like, because with the nonprofits, we apply for grants, foundations, determine what we should be doing, and they pick the one that does the best work according to what they think should be happening. So that perpetuates the issue of white supremacy, in my personal opinion. And so my biggest thing, as I've been saying, a lot of times we have, you know, white, black, whatever savior complex, whatever you want to identify as, when it comes to people that have actually been impacted in the system, not just through incarceration, whether it's through a family member, loved one, child. We want to say, well, I want to be a voice for them. And I always say, like, stop trying to be a voice. Pass the mic. They like, speak for themselves. <laughs> like, and I always say the wisdom is in the room. Just listen. And what you can do is leverage your network and leverage your privilege to get them in the room. And it's not enough just to have a seat at the table. They need to set the table. What's the agenda? What are the talking points? Guide the discussion. You get to speak now. You get to speak now. And like, and not just a placeholder be like, oh, racial equity, we're working with people impacted by the system. Like, no, you're, you're using them. It's pageantry to me. And so unless individuals, and then when I give an example of this, how this is a benefit to you. It's not just, you're not doing some altruism. Give them, this is a benefit to you and society. Prime example, this happened two weeks ago. Um, I work with an awesome group of individuals that I met at the Innocence Network conference, and so, so we've been meeting, and then uh, they school us on like what we need to do better. And there were certain nuances that I wouldn't even think of connecting. One individual brought up, when we're released from prison, we get unemployment benefits. We find a job, and unemployment says we have to pay all that money back. <laughs> and, I would never think about public benefits and like re-entry to that extent. And so I connected the individual to like the public benefits guru for the state. 
And he was like, they were doing that in the 80s. We thought they stopped that. And we're finding they're doing it specifically for this population. Because statutorily, they still have the authority to the discretion, but we thought it wasn't being used with after welfare reform. And so that was just one conversation is now leading to an overhaul of, hey, you don't, is, the, our, we don't even need to make an argument of why that's a horrible idea and just on injustice. But that was an example of, hey, open the room, give us the table, and then leave the table. Because one thing I've noticed, if I come with, that individual is going to want to focus on me because I align with what they deem as credible. You went to a good law school, blah, 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 blah. I just read about stuff, stuff in books, you know? Google and talk to people. Like I don't have the lived experience of things you wouldn't even know to look for. So I really encourage people to leverage their network and their capital to open the door, get people in, and then bounce and let them handle it. So we have about two more minutes left. Um, so, <laughs> Stephen, did you want to jump on that, or anybody else want to I'll jump in. further um, comment? I think one is 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 we talked about this earlier, but it's a lot of these narratives that are out there. I know, brother, but I'm just getting started, man. Um, a couple myths that are out there that I think just in talking with your friends, your colleagues, number one, prison just does not make us safer. We have to, we have to really, really get that in our, in our bones, in our guts, in our spirits. The second thing, most people who have caused harm have been harmed themselves. It's not about good people and bad people. The second thing, it's not about these individual folks. If we just took care of, incapacitated this one person, this thing that we're, that we're wrestling with is structural and historical, and, you need, and we need to focus on that. The fourth thing is, we know what works. So it's not just dismantling, but it's also a lot of building that needs to take place. We know that wealth-based discrimination comes with the bail process. So let's build pretrial services that work. We know that there, are, there can be restorative justice for more serious and violent cases. So let's make that happen. The research is out there, it's clear, it's cut and dry. Let's put the political will and courage to really make it happen. I did that in one minute. Come on. <laughs> well done. Pass the mic to you, brother. What's Stefan said? <laughs> did you want to say something? No? All right. So, <laughs> I really can't do that with no 15 seconds. <laughs> so are there any closing statements or anything that you guys would like to make at this time? I really appreciate sharing space with everybody up here all the brilliance that um, I get to witness and share. And I, and I hope that we're able to continue to build from this moment. Um, and one thing about a lot of these, you come to spaces, you go on panels and you move on to the next. I think we have to co coalesce and continue to build if we're gonna have any chance of making any significant difference. So I really appreciate sharing spaces. And all y'all are brilliant to me. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for being here. Did you want to speak up? Thank you to our panel. It was a great conversation. And yes, everybody do your research and vote. Have a good night. I ain't voting now. I don't know what it takes. We've learned our lesson all the way up this summer.